Okay, I'd like to call to order the, the uh, meeting today. Um, this is the Merit Planning Board. Um, call to order, it's about two minutes after seven. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce the board here. On my far left, I have Peter Brothers, who is the Selectman's representative. Next to him, I have Liv Slappin. And on my left, on uh, my right, I have Ann Butler, Richard Gerken, Ed Tui, and from the town, I have Angela Lebrecht, and then Mary Lee Harvey, who is the town clerk. Uh, looks like we have minutes from March 25th for review and approval. Does anybody have any concerns about the minutes? Any additions or corrections? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, can I have a motion for approval? So moved. And a second? Second. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 No opposed? The motion passes. We have, uh, first we start with the application submissions. We have James Waldron proposed home occupation to have an in-home business for wholesale bait and tackle storage to be housed in an existing building on property tax map R09-1535 Corliss, Corliss Hill Road in the residential district. Angela? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is for a home occupation that will be taking place in, a, in an existing garage space. Um, it's for the wholesale of bait and tackle. The checklist and a butters list are on file. The fee has been paid. A waiver has been requested for environmental information, such as topography, wetland soil, due to there being no site modifications proposed. It's recommended the waiver be granted and the application be accepted as complete for public hearing this evening. Okay, I'd like to have a motion on the waiver and the uh, application. So moved. I have a second. Okay. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that'll be heard later on. The hearing itself will be heard later on this evening. Uh, next, we go to the public hearings. The uh, first one we have is Ippolito Real Estate Trust proposed site plan amendment to change a previously approved color shed sign location. Max map S23, lot 06, located at 193 Danny Webster Highway in the Central Business District. And we have someone represented them. We do. All right. And does he have a name? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Carl Johnson from the Fast Land Surveying in Paris, New Hampshire. I'm here representing the Ippolito Real Estate Trust as well as Color Shed for this minor change to the recently approved site plan that came before you a couple months ago. When Color Shed moved from their existing location down the road a piece to within the Ippolito Furniture Complex. And at that time, we had proposed in addition to the existing Ippolito sign, which would incorporate the new color shed sign in along that sign, making it higher, as well as an additional color shed sign to be located on the front of the building facing the highway. Very shortly after receiving that approval from the planning board, uh, I was approached by the owner of the color shed, really wanting to explore having an independent freestanding sign of their own in front of the portion of the building that they're going to be occupying. 
And that particular part of the ordinance is a little bit vague and a little bit confusing, and we've had discussions with Bill, and basically the way that the ordinance is interpreted is that you're required to go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment for a special exception for a second freestanding sign in this zone, even though the ordinance doesn't quite say that. So we did appear before the, before the Zoning Board. We actually had come before the Planning Board first, and as you recall, you were lacking members enough to have a meeting and as a consequence of that, could not even continue that meeting to a date specific, which we were hoping was going to be the next week. To make it secure that story. So uh, we got permission from Bill and in speaking with Andrew and so forth to go to the zoning board first and get the special exception. And their special exception was granted on May 8th, and the condition uh, of their special exception was to just come before the planning board for the site plan amendment showing the location of the second sign and also what the sign would be looking like. And basically the existing reading board sign, the reading board sign that's being proposed on this second sign which is located in front of the color shed portion of the building is actually the reading board sign that color shed has already down the road on Route 3. So they're just bringing that up and putting it on a sign and then adding the color shed logo sign a little bit smaller than the color shed logo sign that was on Route 3. And we're doing away completely with the color shed sign that's on the face of the building facing out to the highway. So the only color shed logo sign would be the one that's on the freestanding sign. So actually this results not only being complying with the square footage requirements of the zoning board, but it actually results in slightly less square foot signage than what we had approved by the planning board under the previously existing site plan approval because of the reconfiguration of the sign and doing away with the one that's on the building. So the owner of Color Shed worked with Annie Paquette. I believe you have a copy of the sign that's being proposed in the package. And what that does is creates a very much smaller profile in terms of being lower than what the increased height would be to the Lido sign, which, if you remember, is kind of a price tag shaped sign that says it Lido's furniture, and below that is a reader board. Now, what was going to happen is that was going to be raised up to the maximum that's allowed in the zone, and the color shed sign was going to be put in between there. And we feel that this is really kind of a more uh, attractive situation where we don't have that gigantic high sign coming in and we leave the Aplero sign exactly the way it is and just add this uh, relatively small uh, 40 square feet uh, sign with a board. Um, with some landscaping around the base of the sign. And the height of that does comply with the provisions in the ordinance that you can't exceed 20 feet from the elevation of the edge of the highway. So we've added it to the plan, the location to the plan, and we've redone the two little drawings of how the signage will look, as well as redrawing, uh, recalculating the, the square footages that you can see in the chart. If you look at that chart, it gives you a good indication of what this property would be entitled to had there not been a maximum square footage signage allowed. If you, if you read the chart, it's based on the frontage of the property. And of course, they have all of the frontage on Route 3, but they also have all of that frontage on Uncle Pat Hill Road where there's no signage, there's no entrance and so forth, but it counts as frontage. So if you look at this chart, When you do the calculations, it'd be allowed by the frontage to have over 3,000 square feet of signage. But then the ordinance goes on to say that a maximum of 240 is allowed, and we're asking for 228, which is less than that. That's pretty much in a nutshell what they're asking for. 
The special exception was granted by the Zoning Board on May 8, 2014. And we're here for what is considered a minor site plan amendment. Okay. Uh, before I bring it to Angela, is there any questions from the board? I'll ask one myself then. Um, relative to the grade of the road, is this down a little bit, up a little bit? Or? Well, what the ordinance says is that the, the height of the sign is not allowed to be more than 20 feet higher than the grade of the road. So if you went down, you couldn't come up. You, if you went down, you could come up higher because your sign could be higher because your grade is down. This is actually a little bit up, so the calculated amount, this is going to be 18 and a half feet. Up of the sign is going to be 18 and a half feet above the grade adjacent, so it's, it's compliant with the 20 feet. Carl, what is the, the height of the current at the Lido sign? Uh, that's at, uh, at almost at the maximum. Uh, it's at about 18 feet because there is a little bit of a difference in the grade as you go up towards um, towards the highway. Any other questions from the board? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, just a, a, a question as far as the calculation for the sign. If you could just refresh my memory. <coughs> we have a business and that has the Apolito sign. A second business is on site. Is that considered separate or is there an aggregate uh, total signage that's permitted for the site? I'm, I'm going to read for you from the ordinance because it is a little bit confusing, but I'll, I'll, if you just give me one minute, I'll pull it up and I'll read you what it says sure, about you. the aggregate. It goes, the, the sign ordinance goes through the different zones in town. And for most of the zoning ordinance, the requirements within a zone are the same. In other words, if you're in the central business zone, wherever you're in the central business zone, the zoning requirements are the same. Sign ordinance is a little bit different because it identifies the central business district, but then it identifies a certain portion of the central business district. And that says that each property owner with a road frontage of 150 feet or less shall be permitted a freestanding sign with a maximum of 64 square feet per side and an additional building sign to a maximum of 64 square feet. We're not in that portion. Okay, we're in a separate portion of the central business district and it says within that district, it says the balance of the central business district and then it describes it. It says each property owner may have on-premise signs, plural, with total sign surfaces not to exceed three square feet per linear foot of road frontage. That's where you get the 3,000 square feet. But not to exceed 100 square, 120 square feet per side or a total of 240 square feet of signage being allowed. Now it doesn't say anything about a freestanding sign. It says on-premise signs, and if you go to the definition of on-premise signs, it's either freestanding or on the building. Yep. So that's where it's a little vague. But just to be safe, we went to the zoning board and got the special exception. And I think probably, um, at least prior to Bill's passing, we were talking about cleaning up that portion of the ordinance. And in speaking of Jack, who, uh, Jack Deborah, who's the chairman of the zoning board, would like to make that a lot clearer as to exactly uh, what it means. But a total of 240 square foot total on-premise signs is allowed, and we're at 220. Mr. Chairman, follow-up question. 228. Yeah. The, as I, as he indicated, it says owners versus owner and or tenants. So that, that was part of what I was trying well, to Well, the, the confusion is also complicated by the fact that when you have a building like Old Province Common that has multiple uh, tenants in a building, they are also each entitled to a certain square footage on the side. We're not even going there with this though. Okay, but for instance, if um, if it was confusing to people 
where you went into color shed versus where you were going into, they would be allowed to put a small sign, I believe it's 16 square feet, above the door to color shed. That's more like a info informational, a directional sign, not so much an advertising sign. I think it's 32 square feet. We don't propose that right at the moment. All, all the signs that we're proposing is shown on the site. Yeah, well, thank you. And that's just for clarification. The combine we're talking about the combined of two signs is the two. Right. The chart includes both the Ippolito sign and the color shirt sign. And if you remember, just a colloquial comment, that Ippolitos used to have a fairly large sign that said Ippolitos that was on the building, and that became into disrepair, and we took that off. So that's no that's no longer there anymore. But that was kind of a larger. I believe it just said Ippolitos. It used to be there, but that's not there anymore. So, considering the size of the building and the size of the site in front, it really isn't all that much sound on the site. Angela, do you want to? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to direct your attention to page 7. And that shows a um, drawing of a sign that's being proposed. It makes sense to have a second freestanding sign given the distance from the main entrance of Epolitos and where the Epolito freestanding sign is compared to where Collar Shed is going to be way at the other end. So it directs people to that business. So, I, you know, it makes sense. Um, I believe in the ordinance there's a section that says uh, more than one freestanding sign needs a special exception and so they've already received that. Um, it's pretty straightforward. I don't know if anybody has any questions, but it meets all of the requirements of the ordinance. Yes, Peter. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, just a couple of follow-ups. Um, the proposed location of the, of the new sign for Color Shed, um, it, does it interfere with any of the current parking spaces or snow storage or any of those, uh, the, those potential concerns? Yeah. May I answer that? Yeah. I don't have any direct question there. Yeah, you can cancel. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, we took a look at that, and it's two posts, so it's not something that's going to get blocked by the snow getting pushed. And then there's plenty of space over, um, it's like a, just a, it's not really a landscape per se, but there's an area that they can still push snow that they've done in the past. Okay, thank you. We'll check on that. Any further comments before I open it to the public hearing? Kyle, would this review the lighting for this? Uh, yes, internally illuminated. It is internally illuminated. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me open it to the, to the public. Um, it's the public portion of the meeting, uh, of the hearing. Uh, do you have any, does anybody have any questions, concerns, or comments from the public? Hearing none, I guess I'll close the public portion of the hearing. Bring it back to the board for further comments or a motion. Would anybody like to make a motion? Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that in the Request for a site plan amendment by Ippolito Real Estate Trust, tax map S23, lot 106, that we grant condition of approval subject to the fact that the uh, conditional approval to the request for the sign modification, the original site plan subject to the planning board having the right to reserve a uh, right to review and amend any approval as provided for in site plan review regulations number six and seventeen. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Mary Lee, will you hold the board please?
Yes. Yes. Can we get Peter? Yes. Okay. Um, next we have Michael Casey, Robert Hoffman, and Robert Casey. This is a continuation of the public hearing held on September 27, 2011. January 28, 2014, and March 25, 2014, for a proposed condominium subdivision of 4.29 acres with seven existing rental cottages. Uh, tax map U04-16, located at 19 Polar Chars Road on the shoreline and Waukewarn Watershed Districts. Uh, application was accepted on September 27, 2011. Uh, Michael Casey for the applicants. Okay. I know we've gone through quite a bit here already, but is there anything you wish to add at this point? Uh, no, I, uh, again, just to, for any of the newer members, I'd just like to state that what we're proposing is uh, no change of use, uh, no change of size of the buildings, uh, strictly a change of ownership uh, to go from uh, what is now a partnership uh, into a condominium style ownership. Okay. Is there any comment? Before I bring it to Angela, is there any comment from the board? Any questions? Concerns? Angela, why don't you go through your staff review then, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've had a, a couple of public hearings on this, and, and it all started a couple years ago when it first came in front of the board, which um, was then continued um, due to the lack of the of condo documents and. Um, the use being spelled out in those and on the plan. Um, since that time, in the fall of 2013, um, condo docs were submitted, staff reviewed them, the applicant appeared in front of the planning board. We had a couple of public, public hearings. Um, I've gone back and forth with the applicant, met with town council twice, and I think we pretty much nailed down um, the condo docs. There were some questions at the last public hearing, not in in March, um, as we did not meet in April. So in, in March there was um, a few questions um, regarding the operation and and the um, condominium, and, and so I went and met with town council. Um, Richard and Bill came with me and we, we asked some questions. Um, before I get into that, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, I would like to, Mr. Casey already stated, but um, this is a change in ownership and so um, the use will remain um, rental cottages as defined in our or zoning ordinance as a uh, transient lodging units or transient um, occupancy. The site, the site will not go undergo any changes. There's a site plan approval in place that was approved um, quite a few years back, I want to say in 2001. And um, that's referenced in the condo docs and will be referenced also on the final condominium plan that will be recorded. Um, I think now I'll just get into some of the um, issues. Also, I received a letter from Anna Butter, and if you'd like, I can read that into the record before we get into the um, comments. Okay. So I'll, I'll just do that before we get into some of yeah. the questions. Okay. So this letter is um, dated today, and before I get into to reading this, I was approached by um, the abutters, um, Pat, Matt, um, asking if this meeting could be um, continued, and I told her um, that it wasn't because she wasn't able to be here, and I and I let her know that um, 
you know, she could certainly ask the board, but it, it probably wouldn't be likely that it would continue, given that we've had a few public hearings already, and they've had their opportunity to voice their um, concerns, and that the planning board's already exceeded the timeline, which, um, to, to make a, a decision on this um, application. So, I will um, read what she has stated into the record. Um, frankly, I am frustrated. Uh, it's dated May 27, 2014, to the members of the planning board. Frankly, I'm frustrated by the rescheduling of this meeting within an hour of learning that the April 22nd meeting was being postponed to today. I requested that it be rescheduled as I cannot attend due to a previous commitment. My request was denied. I respectfully request that this letter be read during the meeting and entered into the minutes. I have stated our many concerns to which I have received the same response over and over. The request cannot be denied as it is simply a change of ownership. Based on the applicant's very own comments and the way the condo documents read, I disagree. As Mike Casey stated in the last planning board meeting, in quotes, we have not allowed dogs in the past, in quotes. Going forward, they intend to allow dogs and have stated that the recreational vehicle storage area be the place to take the dogs. This is clearly a change of use. At the February meeting, I pointed out an error in the January minutes and asked that the minutes be corrected. Have the minutes been corrected? Have our concerns regarding the storage of owners, renters, and friends' recreational vehicles be addressed in a manner that can be enforced? One of the rentals has already been converted to a year-round permanent residence. How is this board going to prevent this from happening to all of the units? During the March 25th meeting, the applicant stated that there have been as many as 54 motorcycles on the property, and it could be as high as 60 to 70. The highest number of bikes that I've seen in the field during bike week has been a dozen. The applicant's statement, however, does raise a question of how many people are allowed to stay in each of the structures. We request that you carefully consider this matter before you. Thank you, Pat Mack, John Mack. Uh, Michael Case again. I'd like to comment on some of those uh, issues that was addressed by uh, Mrs. Mrs. Mack. Uh, first off, uh, I'm trying to remember, I don't have a copy of the letter, but I'm trying to remember some of the issues that was raised. Uh, I was incorrectly quoted. I, I believe I said in the last couple of years, we have not allowed dogs, um, you know, to be included in the rental. We have not rented to people with the animals, but that's a cleaning issue. It's, uh, we have a turnover of uh, four hours on a Saturday. It, it's, uh, it's difficult. Uh, we made the decision as the, uh, the partners made the decision, but we allowed dogs, I'll bet, for 20 years. Dogs were allowed, uh, and we decided, again, uh, that, uh, it, like many other places, they uh, restrict the use to no pets and no smoking. Years ago, we allowed smoking. Oh, thank you very much. But we don't allow smoking now. Um, I did uh, probably say uh, something like there were 55 uh, motorcycles on the property. There could be as many as 65. I never said there were 55 uh, motorcycles in the field. I said on the property. We do allow the people that come to park just like cars. They can park uh, in the parking spaces. Uh, so for excess, some people bring a trailer with the motorcycles. They, they go to the field. Some people may uh, keep their motorcycles over there. Most of them keep them right by the unit they're renting. And uh, we have had 55, uh, oh, um, my brother takes care of that, but uh, he assures me we've had 55 or more motorcycles on the property. Uh, not on the field. Um, oh, again, uh, she, she said, well, that raises the question of uh, how many people do uh, can stay in the property. I think the board should realize that these are four-bedroom units. 
So uh, I don't think we've ever exceeded the uh, maximum occupancy, and I don't think as owners we would want to do that. We, we uh, restrict it uh, to, uh, we limit the amount of people that can stay in a unit because we don't want 20 teenagers or even 20, 30 year olds. What's uh, the limit? Say. I'm sorry. Did you say what the limit was? It was a, it's a four bedroom. It's a four bedroom, uh, normally, um, if you give me a second. The four bedroom is nine and the five bedroom is ten. Ten. So pretty much we limit uh, to ten people. So ten occupancy. They, they can have guests and uh, things like that, but I mean as far as the rental group, uh, we limit that to ten people. Uh, is there any questions why I look through the rest of the letter? The dogs. Okay, does anyone from the board want to be bring up a question? One what? Uh, Liz, do you want to start? Oh, you just asked. Yeah, I'm a little confused on the dog issue. Um, do you or do you not allow dogs? Dogs are allowed on the property. Uh, one of the owners has a dog that's allowed on the property. We restrict the dog uh, from these transient rental renters that come in as a current policy. We sit down each year and we make that decision whether we're going to allow animals. For the last couple of years, the, the majority opinion has been, or majority vote has been no. But again, out of the, we have owned this property. Uh, for 31 years, and the majority of the time, uh, animals have been allowed. Uh, pets have no, pets have been allowed on the properties. So, let's so I'm clear. The six owners, if this happens, of the proposed condos can have dogs. Yes, we envision. But that the people they rent to cannot bring their dogs. No, there would be no restriction once a particular uh, condominium owner uh, wants to allow um, uh, a transient use with, an, uh, with a pet. They, would, of course, would be responsible for the cleaning. You have to keep in mind, even though we are a condo, we'll have the common areas that will be maintained by the condo, we'll supply utilities, but the inside of the units will be the responsibility of the condominium owner. So if the condominium owner wants to rent to uh, uh, a group or a couple or somebody with a pet, a cat or a dog, because they're the ones that would have to clean up afterwards and prepare for the next uh, renter, that would, we would not put into the condo rules a restriction against pets. So anybody occupying any of the rental cottages can have pets? If the if the Should eventual the owner, yes if the it's, eventual condominium owner possible. allows it yes so pets are allowed in any of the units uh, provided it's approved yeah, by the condominium owner that it's okay with the owner um, and the dogs are allowed to be on the property leashed yeah in the con that's where the restrictions do come into play the condominium regulations state that the, uh, that the, the uh, owner of the uh, pet has to walk the uh, animal dire directly off the property or to, you know, on the well, we northern side of the property. In other words, when they cannot uh, wander around the northern side of the property by the water. So they can be inside the cottage. Inside the cottage. Once they exit the cottage, they need to be on the leash and taken to the field. They have to be on a leash. How do the owners get their dogs on the boats? Or how do the renters get their dogs on boats? Well, I guess you could, uh, I, I guess you would be able to. I mean, you can't, per is it prohibited to have a dog anywhere on the property other than making their way from the cottage to the field? No, the way the regulations, or the condom, condominium uh, regulations are set up, they, they would not allow the dog to be anywhere near the docks, uh, so they would not be able to uh, put the dog on a boat. Uh, unless they brought the boat to a, a public landing and put the dog on that. The dogs would only be allowed inside the unit within the 20 foot, uh, the 20 foot uh, limited common area, common area, the restricted common area, but again on a leash or to walk directly uh, off of the pro northern part of the property to, to the street. So in that blue area that you see on the map kind of That's right. 
the pets would be allowed in the blue area, and they would be if, if they would be able to uh, walk the dog or the cat, I suppose, uh, right off onto uh, Pollard Shore Road, and they would be able to walk around the field area. But as someone on the board pointed out, there is a lease which, uh, ordinance in effect, so they would be required to be on a leash at all times. And I believe that's in the uh, condo regulations, that it, the dog must be under a lease at all times. And so um, I spoke to Pat, and so her concern is the fact that people can have dogs, but they're all being basically funneled to the field across her street. That, that's her concern. Well, I think many uh, dog owners walk a dog a lot further than that. Uh, you know, I would envision the dogs would be walked um, uh, up Pollard Shore Road to Wachiwan Street and then um, either east or west on Wachiwan Street. Um, you know, there's probably no reason just to walk the dog to the field and back unless um, the owner was going to prefer a shot walk. Anybody have any uh, other questions? Because we, we don't normally regulate dogs in the planning board. Um, I suppose no, if we were going we're to just, a, a veterinarian, here, so we're we just, might. We're just voicing her, her concern on her behalf, which I told her I would let the board know her concern about the dogs. That's why she brought it up in the letter. So. Okay. Mr. Chairman. And now it's part of the record as to what exactly is permitted. Okay. I, I believe leasing of dogs is covered by town ordinance, is that correct? Yes. Something, right. Right? So, I mean, that part, I think, you know, dogs roaming free, we have an existing, you know, town requirement. And I uh, believe we have an officer for that, too. We normally have an animal control ordinance. The police department has that? Okay. But it is handled by the town. If there is an issue, it can be brought up to the town authorities. So just get... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Liz. No, this is just a suggestion to you, if this does occur, that you purchase, as we have in our parks, the doggy bags for your, for your residents or your renters to clean up after themselves. Since we're not that far from the lake, and we're yes. going to have an awful lot of dogs up in a very small part um, doing their business. Yes, I agree, and that was one of the uh, reasons we uh, put in that provision that the dogs must be walked directly off of the property because of the issue with the lake. We, we again, want to keep uh, Lake Walking One as clean as possible. So I'm just going to finish going through... Um, whatever other things haven't been addressed in, in her letter, and then we'll move on. Um, she also had concern regarding the storage of owner, renters, and friends' recreational vehicles. Um, in your staff report, which I'm sure you've read, is a um, suggestion that uh, when we met with town council, we discussed this being an issue of, you know, how do you corral the amount of vehicles, you put a number on it, or per unit or for what he, and as we talk through that issue of um, how do you, how do you get your arms around the amount of vehicles in that field, given that it's already um, approved to store recreational vehicles and for overflow parking, how, how do you make sure it doesn't um, get out of control, and after we talked about it for a while, as you'll see in your report, it suggested that the field, the storage of recreational vehicles um, be limited to those vehicles that are registered that belong either to owners or to renters that are occupying the units. So not renters that come every year and they'll store their skidoo until next winter, but when they're actively renting, then they can store their um, recreational vehicle. And so. Um, that was something that town council thought was um, reasonable. May I, may I add something to that? Um, my recollection um, is that, Mr. Casey, um, Section 702 of your covenants or your uh, condominium documents 
uh, was, what was to be modified to include provisions that no unregistered vehicles will be stored on the property and the storage is for only owners and, and renters users during the period of occupancy. Um, in conjunction with uh, the two, 2001 site plan, uh, which is uh, applicable, uh, including all the notes and all the previous decisions of the CBA, um, in effect, that clarifies, and hopefully it clarifies for uh, Butter's concerns that the, 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 that the property won't become what we call a dumping ground. So, um, and and, and uh, also the 2001 approved site plan has a, has a note concerning the number of approved parking spaces on the property uh, for the units. We seem to be missing a page. Is that what you're looking at, Angela? Yeah, yeah. I just noticed that. Nine and a half. Nine and a half. And so that that's that suggestion. I actually um, that wasn't incorporated into the revised condo docs. It's kind of up to the board to recommend that suggestion to the owner. So that, that's kind of where it was left. And then um, I guess the last thing that we haven't covered here is um, how is the board going to prevent this from happening to all the units? One of the rentals has already been converted to a year-round permanent residence. Um, like other places that we have in town, um, campgrounds, people have their seasonal campers there. They open them up in the spring and they close them up on Columbus Day weekend. Um, those places are people occupying those units and living in those places, even if it is for um, you know a six or seven month period, aren't allowed to claim residency, and the town clerk is aware of those places. So like those others that she has on the list, um, Power Chores condominiums will be one of those other um, transient type of places where people aren't, won't allow, be allowed to claim um, that that's their residence or permanent dwelling. Okay. Yeah, I understand. Uh, I understand her concern. Who who places these things? We as a planning board put down conditions and the like. Who places them? And really, what it comes down to is that the neighbors have to remain alert. And if they see a violation, that they bring it to the attention of the code enforcement officer. Uh, you know, there's been many things that have come before the board in the past, uh, and uh, uh, your eyes are, uh, are really the best. You know, the you see what's going on. Uh, what?
It's a good experience. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's a, you used to rent from us when you were in California, right? Whoa, good memory. Oh, you were in California. Yes, yes, the entire time I was up in California. Man, you've got a really good memory. Yeah. Yeah. And you moved back here? Yes, What are you doing for the bus? Oh, oh, thanks a lot. Those are the ones you use. Yeah. Oh, which one? The one that's right behind the. Yeah, the weeds. They're all over the place. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
comments, we also have a memo that uh, Richard Gerken wrote regarding the uh, meeting we had. I believe that was distributed to the members of the planning board. Just information. Um, Angela, do you want to? Yes, I'm going to. I'm going to continue on. Um, so we did talk to count where I left off is uh, the issue regarding um, the number of recreational vehicles stored in the field across from the cottages. And so there's been something added to the staff report that um, that talks about that. We also talked to town council about, um, there was a concern brought up at the previous meeting, what defines transient occupancy? And is there, um, you know, a, a, law, a New Hampshire law or, or something that speaks to what transient occupancy is? Our zoning ordinance doesn't specifically state what, what makes a resident, uh, someone a resident or, or what makes, what's the, time limit on a um, transient occupancy and so um, there is no black and white this is the duration of time somebody could be in a unit um, that defines it as transient and then the next day it becomes you know a residence um, he said that certainly if somebody were in a cottage for three months it would be Transient. If someone were in a cottage for 365 days, it wouldn't be. There is a gray area, and it's a judgment call, and it's left up to the zoning administrator to make that judgment call. And um, that's the guidance we got from town council. He said in quotes, there was, there's no absolute duration of what of transient occupancy. Um, as far as the caretaker residence goes, that, that was another issue that was brought up. And uh, the, the comment was, well, the planning board did not approve a cottage to be a caretaker residence. And so how did that occur? And um, that occurred um, because it was found that it was a caretaker a caretaker unit was found to be accessory to the operations of the rental cottages. It's common in New Hampshire, it's common everywhere that um, there be a caretaker living on site to distribute keys, uh, check people in, deal with, you know, hot water not, not working or, or what have you. And so, um, you know, I have, I have an email from Bill and it stated he found that it would be accessory and that, um, and then I ran it by town council and he said it was common and it, it definitely is something that um, is not out of the ordinary and did not find, find that to be an issue. He did not find it to be an issue that the planning board did not approve a caretaker residence. Um, Similarly, he had the, the same thought about um, boats being rented with cottages. Um, you know, boat probably isn't as common as, like, say, a kayak or um, maybe cross-country skis, but, but he found that certainly if it's not a standalone boat rental operation and that it goes specifically with the rental of a cottage, then it could be accessory to the rental of the cottage. And so, um, you know, there we go again. Something else that wasn't app approved by the planning board per se, but through um, this sort of administrative approval um, was allowed to, to occur. And um, so that's why uh, I think nailing down a lot of these, these things in condo, in the condo document is important moving forward so that you don't have these incremental administrative approvals that, quote, the planning board did not approve. Um, I'm looking to see my notes from when we met with town council. But we also talked about um, the units not all being not being on um, separate meters, 
and that that's something left up to the water and sewer department. And um, you know, should should a different superintendent in the future um, feel differently about that, then um, he he suggested we leave that up to the water and sewer department's approval in the future, and that the planning board just know um, that the meter situation needs to be. Um, reviewed and approved by that department. And I believe those were all of the issues that were brought up at the last meeting that I was directed to talk to town council about. Um, uh, is there anything else, Richard or Bill, that I, I missed from our meeting? Uh, Angela, the only thing that I would add uh, would be a confirmation um, that the approved site plan of 2001 and, and, and everything uh, that the property is subject to that site plan and the applicable notes, restrictions, and conditions that were contained on that site plan, as well as previous uh, uh, Meredith ZBA decisions. Um, and uh, this, this prior history, uh, I believe, is, is supposed to be incorporated into Section 302 of the Declaration. And, it's, and the, they are incorporated. They are. Okay. they are incorporated, and I also suggest adding a note to the plan that cross-references oh, okay. the approval and the documents also cross-reference. So it's in the plan, the decision, and the, and the docs. Okay, any further questions from anyone on the plan? Hearing none, I'll open this up to the public. Are there any questions, concerns, or issues from the public? I don't see any, so hearing none, I'll close the public portion of the meeting and bring it back to the board for any additional comments or for a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to make a motion. Certainly. Um, he did. I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to make a motion in the matter of Michael J. Casey, Robert Hoffman, Robert K., and Mary Ellen Casey, uh, proposed subdivision application um, in map U04, lot 16, Pollard Shores Road, in the Walking One Watershed District. Uh, in, excuse me, in the watershed and the shoreline district and multi one watershed overlay. Um, recommend approval uh, of the plan. Conditional um, approval plan. Thank you. Uh, subject to the following um, conditions. Um, that a note should be added to the plan stating approval of the site plan on, the, on file with the town of Meredith dated November 26, 2000 and approved on June 26, 2001 in all conditions and restrictions from previous planning board and CBA approvals shall remain in place. Also conditioned upon the use restriction of rental college and cottages having a transient occupancy shall be noted on the plan. Also, the note should be added to the plan indicating the site is located within the water, water, Waukee One Watershed Overlay District. Uh, also, the condition that any future changes of meters or connections to the municipal sewer system is subject to approval by the Water and Sewer Department. Also subject to the condition that limits of the storage area shall be restricted to the area shown on the approved site plan. It has been noted in the declarations, uh, condominium declarations, and shall be noted on the plan that the storage area is limited to the existing area and may not be expanded without consent of the planning board. Another condition is that, uh, excuse me a second here, uh, okay. that, um, and I would recommend that the 
uh, if they haven't been done so, the, uh, co the covenants and documents, uh, a restriction be placed that uh, recreation vehicles, boats, slash trailers, and overflow parking be limited to those vehicles registered to the cottage owners or their renters during the time of their occupancy. Okay. Um, final approval of the condominium documents shall be submitted to the town for, for final sign-off prior to the planning board um, final plan, excuse me, final condominium documents shall be submitted to the town for final sign-off prior to the planning board's final plan approval. Um, the conditional subdivision approval is valid for 24 months, at which time final approval must be obtained or a public hearing must be held uh, for the planning board to grant additional time. Um, uh, okay. uh, and that's the end of my motion. Uh, one, clarif one clarification. Uh, yeah, that's a merit. Uh, right here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me go back a step here. Um, uh, my that um, limits the storage area shall not shall be restricted to the area shown on the approved site plan noted in declarations and shall be noted on the plan that the storage area is limited to the existing area and may not be expanded without consent of the planning board. Um, that includes uh, any um, excess trimming or, or expansion of the lot by trimming of the foliage. That's a clarification. Can I ask for one clarification? Sure. Um, and I'm thinking specifically on the overflow parking. I assume that would also be eligible for guests of the renters. That's what overflow parking presumably is. Is that okay with you? Is it with you, Mr. Griffin? Yes, sir. I did. Because I it's a little different than I thought. Right. Okay. Um, well, it's conditioned upon a restriction uh, that recreational vehicles, boats, trailers, overflow uh, overflow parking, be limited to those vehicles registered to, to cottage owners or renters during the time of their occupancy. I've modified, in effect, the last clause, as it appears. Um, I'm just a little confused of a, of a restriction could be. We're not saying should be. Because there was lots of discussion. Richard's motion did not say there could be a restriction. He said right. the restriction is. He said okay. he is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a second motion? As adjusted. Not motion and second. Any comments or questions regarding the motion? Hearing none. Harry, we okay. okay. Peter, did you second it? The, uh, I, I'm saying I, I was ready to do that, but I thought you did, so. 
Ed seconded it. That's correct. Okay, so I, I... Peter was about to second it. You beat him. Okay. Is it open for discussion? I did ask if anyone cared to discuss it. Oh, you mean... Discussion rather than who seconded it? <laughs> you seconded it, right? I did. Okay. Do you have any questions or concerns regarding the motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make an amendment okay. to the motion. All right. And, and Liz, actually, I'm picking up where you left off because of it being within the Wakawan district and concerned about the uh, dogs being, being walked along a designated area. Uh, could we make a requirement that, which I, I, think, I think you agreed to, uh, that they put into the condo documents a requirement that plastic bags be, be provided at all times at the uh, storage vehicle lot. And that it be the responsibility, obviously, of people to clean up after their pets. Does anyone care to discuss the Try. Excuse me, can I make a comment? Any comment? Is the board open for a comment? I don't have a problem with that, if that's what I'm yeah. uh, Actually, the comment's not about the bags. Uh, it's going back slightly to that, uh, the vehicles in the field. Uh, and again, uh, the board did not put in guests uh, when, they, when they mentioned that. They were saying the old full park will be limited to the owners and the renters. Again, we have, uh, especially on a particular weekend, they may have a big family gathering. So they're not technically renters, but that's where they park. Or like if you're having a family birthday, you, so the guests, again, this isn't storage of vehicles, strictly parking of vehicles. So if the, if the wording on, on his uh, motion is storage, I have no problem with strictly renters. He, has, he had said that it was amended. He did say that it was okay for that to include guests, is that, is that correct? For the overflow parking? Yeah, I, I, I did not wish to amend anything regarding the overflow parking. No, I'm, I'm, talking, to I, Mr. I'm talking to Mr. Gurkin. All I wished to, to do was to add a restriction to be entered into the condominium documents that plastic bags be provided for people to dispose of the waste of their own pets. Here, that's all. Um, okay, let me, let me go back to Mr. Tu. Uh, I thought, so Liz or someone, someone mentioned getting the word, or guest, didn't they? I did. You I did. did. And you said, yeah, I said that was okay. Okay. So you. Would, okay, so what I was trying to change was, was, the, was the, uh, the last part of that clause, but you probably should read register to cottage owners uh, renters or their guests during the time of their, well, let's see, renter, cottage owners or renters, who guests of whom, sir? They would, they would be the guests of the renters. Okay, so because it would be cottage owners or renters, their get, renters and their okay. guests, I guess, would be entered. I would say and. Um. The, during, the, during, during the time of their occupancy. Correct. Okay. All right. Is that clear? So it's cottage yes. owners or renters and their guests during the time of their occupancy. Thank you. I guess I need another clarification on guests now because is the guest just coming for the day and then leaving? Or is this a guest that's going to sleep on the pull-out couch uh, for the week? Um, sometimes when we have guests, they and, or we have a big party, they, we pick them up somewhere, or they park their car in a parking lot in town. Or uh, I, I'm just confused on how suddenly we're getting, I, I, can, I can agree with uh, cottage owners and renters. Well, um, I, guests, are, uh, how do we know how duration the guests are going to stay? I, if I may comment on that, overflow parking is for overflow from the designated parking, which would be and it's for guests. It's for people who have guests, people who are coming over. That's what we have parking for. 
And that's why you have this as designated as overflow parking if there are more guests than can fit on that parking. That was well, my intention with, with making that comment. Well, my understanding is that there's only two parking area, two parking spaces at the rental units, right? I guess. But so my, my that's motion, my suggested amendment that it be also for their guests. I've agreed to that. Okay, agreed to that, and I believe Mr. Edney's or somebody, Mr. Edney seconded to the agreed one. Um, and we also have a amended request regarding the dogs and the doggy bags. Um, where would you put that? Are there any further comments or discussions on this? Well, I don't know where you put that. It's an additional concern. I'm trying to figure out, we're, 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 he's, I'm trying to figure out, first of all, what's your, what's, what's uh, Mr. Uh, Casey's reaction to that? Michael. Yeah, okay, all right. Um, you, had, you had no objection to that uh, restriction of the animals? I have no objection. Uh, can we just handle that administratively, that that become part of the condominium? Yeah. Uh, we would agree to that. Okay. All right. So, how are we going to amend it again? Ed? Okay. I'll accept his amendment. Okay. Unless anybody has any. Further objections or clarifications? I would like Mary Lee to call the board, please. Justin Bennett. Uh, let's see. Now we have uh, James Waldron, proposed home occupation to have an in house business for wholesale bait and tackle storage to be housed in existing building on property tax map R09 1535 Corliss Hill Road in residential district. Carl Johnson, with Vance Lanservain, and I'm here representing James and Janet Waldron because Jim Waldron was not able to make it this evening because he was involved in an automobile accident a couple weeks ago and broke his neck. So I'm standing in, he's recovering, he's out of the hospital and currently at the Genesis uh, Rehab Center recovering. So I'm going to be doing my best to do this presentation regarding my home occupation to be located at their home on Corliss Hill Road in an existing garage structure that uh, has been used for storage of miscellaneous things 
uh, over the years. This is being brought about somewhat because, as you know, what I call for about, I think, 40 years, Walgreens Bait Shop, which is now AJ's Bait Shop, is being uh, relocated. And AJ is moving out of that building and Jim Walgreens' um, wholesale bait portion of that is, has to also be relocated. And so the proposal here is a home occupation in that Jim and Janet live at the residence here that's located, as you see on the plan, and they have an existing garage, and they're going to be storing the bait, wholesale bait, at that location within the garage. This is entirely a wholesale operation. There is no retail component associated with this proposal. In other words, there will be no people coming to the site to buy bait. Essentially what happens is one time during the week there will be a delivery during the daytime hours in a small vehicle and the bait is delivered in plastic containers and then Jim transfers from the truck to his tanks, which would be located in the garage. And then Jim takes that bait in smaller containers and delivers to his uh, retail bait shops. And it's very much a daytime operation. There's not any significant traffic that's uh, caused as a result of this proposal. And he also stores some tackle supplies as well. The great majority of the bait that's being stored at the site is fish bait. There's a very small component of pre-packaged worms and crawlers that are delivered in boxes and they're stored in refrigerated compartments within the garage and those are also delivered. During busy portions of the year, for instance the fishing derby, Jim actually goes to the wholesale bait distributor and gets the bait and delivers it directly to the bait shops. It cuts out kind of like the intermediate step of bringing it to his place and then delivering it just because it's, it's so busy. So that doesn't pose a problem during the course of one of those events. There is a set of requirements in the ordinance regarding home occupation and all of those will be met by this. In the Angela staff review, she wants a confirmation of the total store, total square footage of the wholesale bait storage operation proposed on this plan does not exceed 25% of the total overall, and it doesn't. And so I will, I will compute that, and you will submit it in a letter or add it to the plan. There's also a request to add the lot size and maximum permitted lot coverage be added to the plan and, and that is 30 percent as you can see you're, you're going to be well well underneath that and I can compute that and add it to the plan as well. It was a comment that there's no sign proposed and I don't know if it was a case of not having the plan that was submitted reflect the plan that you have in your packet but it does show a sign located at the beginning of the driveway, which is just a two foot by three foot sign with the company name on it, which is more or less an information on the structural sign, but that's where to turn in, and it's not really an advertising situation because there is no retail component. People are not going to be coming to this property to purchase bait. It's wholesale only with no retail component. There are certain requirements that the person who's actually the owner, the, the, at least one of the employees in the business, and that of course is true. Jim has been doing this for quite some time, and he is the primary uh, employee of the business. There's a comment regarding the parking, and there are actually two residential uh, parking spaces within the garage. There's two residential parking spaces outside of the house. There's an additional parking space that's located to the right of the garage 
And what doesn't show up adequately in the plan, but is there, is there's actually quite a bit of gravel off the existing driveway available for parking should you need it, which I don't think you would right in this location. So I don't think parking will be an issue, especially because there will not be any people coming to the property to purchase retail, either fish, bait, or supplies. There's no additional lighting proposed. There's no additional reconfiguration of the site. No additional, uh, no additional structures being proposed at this time for the property. So we believe that this meets the requirements of the home occupation, and I will make those requested additions to the plan that Angela suggested. We did, of course, because this is a home occupation and there's nothing essentially being done to the site, we did ask for a waiver of the majority of the normal site plan review requirements because of the limited nature of the proposal. That's pretty much the presentation. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Is there any further any questions from Mr. Chairman? Yes. Carl, would you go with the sign thing one more time? You don't you don't know whether he's gonna pick a do a six foot sign or not? Or just an informational it's a sign? Six square foot sign. So six. it's two feet by three feet. Okay. okay. Yes, and it's located I'm not sure if you had that on your plan, but it, it should say proposed six square foot sign, and that's just to show where where it's located. Un unlit, just hanging on, hanging on a post. Angela, is there anything you wish to add to? Um. The home is, rec is located in the residential district where home occupation is a permitted use. And um, from what Carl has described, it seems like it's a pretty innocuous use, um, just, I guess, storing worms in the garage for the most part. Um, one truck delivery per week seems like a pretty um, limited amount of traffic. I'm assuming there's enough turnaround room Obviously yeah, it's, it's a relatively small, it's, it's a, actually, it's like an F-350, a large size pickup truck. So oh, okay. It's, yeah, it's not like a box, box okay. truck. And all deliveries are made by um, Mr. Waldron off-site, so From people, site, people aren't coming to pick anything up. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the process is there are actually plastic containers which the water is infused with oxygen. So they really pack the pack the fish in there so they can you know deliver quite a few fish in a very small container. And I also did ask regarding any type of a power outage, what would happen, you know, in terms of fish. And of course they have quite a bit of their own natural staying power, uh, staying power, and that if anything went beyond a day or so, um, you know, Jim would just simply go rent a, a small power generator to keep the tanks going. But Really, nothing to to uh, be concerned about. That's all I have. Um, it meets all the zoning. Nothing on the site is changing, other than the home occupation moving into an existing structure. It's a large lot. I mean, they need lot coverage setbacks and and everything else um, required by the zoning, so it seems to fit the parameters of a home occupation. Thank you. Uh, before I open this to the public, any questions from the board? Hearing none, uh, let me open it, the public portion of this hearing. Yes, uh, if you would, if you come up and give your name. My name is Sue Cribby. My name is Sue Cribby. And I'm right there at 41 Corliss Hill Road. And one of my main concerns is, um, well, it's a one, one day a week delivery in a small truck. But the, generation, the generator, uh, what's going to keep these fish alive, 
Is it going to be noisy? Um, what's going to happen with the dead fish? Is it going to get tossed out and back and all the smell? Um, I was more concerned of the traffic because I'm on a busy corner. Um, my husband wanted to be here, but he couldn't, so he's relying on me to get the, you know, get things answered. Um, yeah, his main concern was, you know, the noise factor from keeping these worms, you know, worms that are in the, the dirt, but fish for bait. You know, these things die. I don't know, I don't know how big the fish are going to be. Minnows or big fish. Um, Carl, would you carry on answering these concerns? Sure. Ooh. The, the fish that are stored here are bait fish, they're smelt and shiners, so they're the little the small fish. And there are tank, what they call aerated tanks, and they just run with a very small pump, it's about the size of a small hand pump that aerates these tanks, so there's no noise, so there's no outside noise associated with these small pumps that aerate the tanks. There's no larger, he doesn't deal in the larger you know, cusp or any type of uh, bait fish like that, so it's the smelt and shiners. And a small percentage of it are the worms, which are stored in the refrigerator, just a normal refrigerator. And so there's no noise associated with that. And those come all pre-packaged in there. There's no transfer of the worms from one medium to another. They come pre-packaged in their containers, and then they're just delivered as part of this uh, fish delivery. And uh, when I was talking to Janet about the life of the fish and whatever, there's actually quite a very small amount of fish that don't survive this process and that, um, you know, this is not, this not a need for concern of uh, huge amounts of dead fish that are going to have to be disposed of on the site because it's just not the nature of um, how the business is these days. What would be the disposal of the fish if there was something goes wrong? I was just right. saying something goes wrong, whether it be disease or... Uh, extended power outage. I, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, the extended power outage was addressed to the fact that you'd have a small, and what I mean, one of the small generators, one of those small hand generators that would come into play if it was you know, more than a couple of days. But the fish have the ability to live on their own, you know, within the within the water, even the non-aerated water, for a fairly long period of time. So the the generator you're referring to would be just. It's probably smaller than you'd use for your own home if you were right at it. Like one of those uh, hand pull, very small generators, just enough to keep a couple of hand pumps going. So the daily operation is you plug something into an outlet in the Correct. garage and it runs the yep. pumps. Thank right, you. it just runs off a normal uh, 120 current, all the pumps and the refrigeration. Yeah, there's no additional power needs. Another one of my concerns was, um, is, is his garage going to be the only building? Uh, he has a red, a red existing big building right there by the street. And my concern is I, I wouldn't want it there. Yes, I believe she's speaking. There's a couple of older sheds on the building and they're not part of the proposal. The storage is only within the garage area that's shown here. Now, there is a limitation on the amount of area that you can use for a home occupation. Um, it's not the, it's the 25% of the total square footage of the area. In other words, it's, it's a home with a home occupation. It's not a home occupation that happens to have some people living there. You know, it's not a business with a couple of people having to live there. Yeah, so it's, it's out of his garage. Is, does he have one running there now, or does he have any fish there now, or anything? You know, because if he did, then... Yeah, I'm not aware whether he does or doesn't have anything there now. I know that he had to leave his building, so some things in a pinch may have been transferred there. Okay. In, in, the, in the interim? Yeah. Like in the past, like just a few weeks, most recently, I, I know that they had to move out of that building, and so we only meet once a month, and so there may have been a, a you know, he may have had to move some of his supplies from that portion that he had his business on Main Street. He may have taken some of his supplies and moved them there. Um, 
so it's going to be, you know, I don't have to worry about it running 24-7 because it's you no know, noise factor. So, um, and it's only one day a week, the truck delivery. Um, what time would the truck be coming? Early, early morning? Or? So the normal delivery, uh, and this is the notes that I took from speaking with Janet on the phone today, the normal delivery is uh, daytime Thursday. She didn't mention specifically what time during the day, but said it was during the daytime hours on Thursday. And it's, a, it's a small truck, so it's not going to Should there be big trucks and deliveries every day at all hours? That's not what was presented. And so um, should that occur, certainly it would bring it back to the board to review something that was beyond that what was presented. So that, that's what the approval is based on. You know? And smell of the fish or a rotted anything that you need. Anything beyond what reasonably what was presented here. If you're if you're concerned, then, with regard to a nuisance, you know, smelly people dumping stuff in the backyard or um, the borderline or something like that creates a nuisance. That's come to the town attention, and you know, that's to be dealt with at that point. And you know, how about containers? Uh, is it going to be piles and piles of? Again, that the, uh, you know, again the disposal and so forth relates to whether he's creating a public nuisance. Containers that come. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could stop getting like building a wall of these things sometimes. No, the fish, the fish that are delivered are in these compressed boxes and containers, and they're they're dumped from that container into Jim's tanks, and then that guy takes his container okay. with him, and then Jim has smaller containers that he will store inside of the building that he uses to transfer the fish out to the bait shops, and he he makes those deliveries essentially in a pickup truck. Further comments? Okay. Hearing none, I'll close the public portion of the hearing, bring it back to the board for further discussion or a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion. Yes. Um, on the proposed site plan for home occupation for James Walden, tax map R09, lot 1535 Corliss Hill Road, the watershed district of Millbrook. In this uh, residential district in the zoning district. Um, so, uh, let's see. The proposed site plan is for the purpose of establishing a home occupation at a residence located on Corliss Hill Road. The home occupation is for wholesale bait and tackle storage and is an established business until recently located below AJ's Bait and Tackle on Main Street, Meredith. There will be no retail sales as part of this home occupation. It is wholesale only. Um, yes. 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 Uh, I'm going to take a short break. And we'll be back in.
a possible development on tax map S23 lots 34, 35, and 36 located on Commerce Court in the Business and Industry District. Hi folks, I'm Justin Benton from 106 Tracy Way and I'm also the owner of Stewart's. And um, very quickly, Stewart's has been looking for a new home for almost as long as I've owned it. It's about seven years now. A very complicated process for us because of response times that are involved, public safety issues. You can't be around small children, you can't be around, you know what I mean, the elderly, because our vehicles move at high speeds. Uh, we, or I, own a couple of lots already that we had looked at originally for uh, possible Stewart's spaces. And part of the problem was originally I was thinking more public locations, more publicly visible. Um, the problem is publicly visible buildings should be pretty and nice and attractive. And quite frankly, that's not in keeping with our mission, which is provide the best possible health care at the lowest cost to our towns. So the lot that I own, say, between McDonald's and Nicolitos, which was originally for this, was a great idea, but when you think that that might add three or 400000 to the cost of the building, that either gets passed along to the various taxpayers and communities we serve, or it comes out of the money that I can use to provide care. Um, so where we are right now is I figured out all the lots in Meredith, because we want to continue to be headquartered here. Uh, that meet our needs and I cold called all of them uh, over the last couple of years and we finally got a bite on a couple of lots on Commerce Court. The guy is actually a retiring uh, fire chief down out of Massachusetts. Uh, he was going to use it to train bomb sniffing dogs but for some other reasons that it, it's not going to work out for him. Um, let me make sure I'm covering everything here on my notes before I go to the exact map. Um, so what we want to do, I've had conversations with Angela, I've had conversations with John, and I've had conversations with Bill, uh, is we're going to be coming to you guys looking for a phase development, if I'm saying this correctly, um, because I know what we need as a company today, but today our company is three times the size of what it was when I took it over seven years ago. And there's two major changes in the state of New Hampshire in terms of the way our job is done. Uh, the first, if you hadn't heard, is something called community paramedicine, and what that means is we have a lot of downtime for our staff. In a typical 24-hour period, my ambulance, each ambulance individually, treats two patients. So the rest of the time, they're just sitting around. Um, the idea is to partner with kind of a VNA type of organization. We've spoken to the VNA in the hospital. Um, and be out more in the public. So if you're a resident of Meredith, let's say, for example, and you know that you have congestive heart failure, maybe we stop by your house three or four times a week when we have quiet time just to check on you, check on your blood pressure, see how you're doing, so that we're not waiting until you get to an emergency room situation before you're sick. Um, the other part of it is wheelchair van service. We used to be in wheelchair vans uh, right when I first took over the company. Um, and then the state of New Hampshire changed their Medicaid reimbursement. Medicaid is the only one that pays for it. They now pay less than what taxi cabs do um, to transport somebody by wheelchair. So we shut down our part of the business. Everyone else did too. Now the state is saying, well, criminal, we can't move anybody by wheelchair van. I say this only because with what we do now, we have a fleet of 13 vehicles. I could see in two years the need to have a fleet of 30 vehicles. So what I'm trying to do with this site is make sure that we cover all of our needs today, but that we reasonably have, without going overboard, what our needs are in the future covered as well. Um, so is this close enough? If not, I can bring it up a little closer. Is that? Do you have copies? Yeah. Well, yeah. Why don't you let us know the taxes and lot numbers are? Um, I can Let's see, tax map S23. May I steal this? Yeah. Is that okay. Uh, S23 lots 34, 35. Uh, you have to turn it on, Justin. There we go. Yeah. S23 lots 34, 35, and 36. Um, one of them is currently owned by Chuck Thorndike. The other two are owned by uh, Mr. Tortolano out of Massachusetts. Yeah. Across the street, what you're saying? There. Yeah. Yes. And right here. And there's two cul de sacs going on. Mine's big S24 and just go over. 
is the appropriate level of development in the BNI district for something like this? Because what I don't want to do is ask for you know this much, knowing we may need something more in the future and constantly come back. But I also don't want to ask for you know some ridiculous number and have you guys go, good lord, what in the heck are you asking for here? Um, so what are the guidelines you guys look for? He's working for us. Oh, yeah. Sure. For the, for the record, I'm Carl Johnson, and I'm, I'm working with Justin on the site. And I think you know, the, the business and industry zone is specifically designed for high lot coverage to get that type of development in this area. It's away from the highway. It's away from general visibility. So 75% lot coverage is allowed, and that includes buildings and pavements and so forth, so that would not be unreasonable. The other advantage that uh, Justin has is really his businesses that he's uh, proposing for the most part are employee dr driven for parking spaces. You don't need a ton of parking spaces um, with, for the building size. If you were to take the building square footage and plug in the parking sizes, he probably needs about a tenth of what those numbers would be. So that's an advantage and you can uh, you know, reduce the amount of impervious surface for parking. So where we're headed is trying to develop it um, in a phase situation and showing potential future development for the lot, uh, but fall within the, the maximum lot coverage allowed. Um, just to add, because I forgot from earlier, um, I do currently have a proposed and pending uh, water easement going across this lot to our town water supply, if we deem that's better than a well. Um, I also have a verbal on a sewage easement. Um, there's a sewer line coming up through the condo development. That one's proving to be a little bit trickier than we initially thought it was because the owner of the condo development was fine with it. Um, but as it turns out, I also need Townsend Thorndike to approve because it goes across his property. And then perhaps most challenging, the out-of-state, believe it or not, uh, is the out-of-state bank that is the mortgage holder also has to, and banks are just miserably uncooperative now. Um, the chances of getting them to pay attention to it enough to give... And then to some. <laughs> out of state banks. Out of state banks. Non community bank. Yeah. Um, it, it is going to be so. We are looking at the possibility of septic design. Our sewer needs for a building. These type of buildings are not, you know, they're, they're, they're lower impact than a residence. Um, and yet, to Carl's point, I mean, the nice thing is we're talking about a 7,500 square foot building, but actually half of the building is just parking spaces for ambulances. So. Um, we do. garage space where you park ambulances condition differently than say the rest of the area? It is. Um, I mean you don't keep a garage at 68 do you? Okay. No. 52 actually. Uh, we are required by state law to be at 50 degrees for all the ambulances because of the drugs and narcotics that are on the ambulance. Okay. Uh, that's part of the benefit for this. Basically we're going to have roughly speaking 12 foot high foundation walls that will go the entire three sides of the building and so the reason the, for the that. So the building will sit right into that slope? Exactly. Create a lot of thermal mass. Um, and because it's below grade at, what, 46, 48 degrees, we'll use radiant floor heat. So you don't have to do much to bring up that last four or five right. degrees. We are doing some other, I will tell you, green friendly stuff. Um, in all likelihood, we're going, again, it's not the most attractive thing in the world. It's, it's all but a flat roof, uh, but it's because it's going to be angled. We've got a near perfect southern exposure, basically, I guess is what we're saying. And so we're going to use a combination of heat pumps to heat and cool the entire building, um, and then solar panels on top of all that. So. Um, that's one of the other benefits of the BNI district. I wouldn't dare try and do a building like that, say next to McDonald's or next to Ippolito's, but being in, you know, off the main drag. I mean, the only other neighbor that we have there is quality insulation. So it looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then 
then back to what you were asking before, what's the maximum amount of development? I don't think there is a maximum. I think with every site has unique site conditions and you know being mindful of the wetlands and um, you know being able to get in what you can get in or what you need I think is also important like Carl said it is 75 percent but I wouldn't recommend just going to 75 percent just because just because I mean you know what what do you need and also with respect to um, phase development I mean this is a foreseeable future phase not right yeah, in that, perpetuity, I mean, no, exactly. Yeah. So. yeah you know, I think it's a wise thing to plot out everything. It's kind of, and certainly our demographics are not are such that it's going to be growing business. I think it's wise to give us the whole picture. Yeah. Um, you know, to make it what, what you need to be the most useful. I think if you explain your One of the things I mentioned to Justin is that when you show a phase development, it's not an obligation to do the phase if that no. expansion is not critical to the rest of the development. In other words, you know, if you just decide not to do phase three because economy changes or whatever, you're not obligated to do it. But to put the things out there to do some preliminary planning in terms of buildings and parking to show what might happen on the site is very helpful for not only the owner but for the board so that we're not coming in with the site plan approval in 2014, coming in with another site plan approval in 2015, coming in with another one, um, so that you get to see the whole picture at once. Okay. I'll follow on. I mean, part of it is just from an economic standpoint. Let's say we go septic instead of sewer. Um, I'd rather design one septic system that can accommodate all of the buildings that we made because the incremental cost of doing that now is tiny as opposed to deciding next year we need another 8,000 square feet and trying to do a separate septic system or adding on to it. Um, so the idea is really to work with you guys and, you know, I, I, I'm just throwing a number out here. I haven't actually looked, but let's say we ask for an additional 20,000 square feet of, of ambulance storage on there. We might only ever use 8,000 square feet of it, but I'd rather design everything, the, the LID, the rain gardens, the septic system, to accommodate any future growth that we have, because I figure that'll be cheaper at this point. Um, um, I don't know how that works out if our zoning changes between getting a phase development approval. I think, I think phase, of, I don't know, I, I'd have to look at other previous developments that were done and permitted in phases to see how um, past plenty boards looked at it, because I can't say since I've been here that I can really recall something truly being um, phased like that, you know, like like when Wasaki Theater is kind of phased, but but you know not not to. I mean, they've developed all that they were going to develop, but they have like um, you know things are going to happen in phases, but it's not this kind of like new development like you're talking about. So you know that's something I can look into and let you know how that worked out. You know, many times you put a uh, bottom end on a site plan approval; it's good for 24 months, and you could put. Um, you know, this this is approved with the phase two approved out 24 months, and then if it does get, if it's not approved in 24 months, you would have to come back in for review of the board. It'd be a cursory review, but at that time you could review whether or not there are any substantial changes to the zoning ordinance would, which would pertain to the site plan. Yeah, possibility. I mean, we just we just. We did B and I district, so I, I don't know that it's going to get <laughs> not overhauled yeah. anytime in the near future. But, but that's, that's something to think about. You know, offhand, do we need a special exception for this? Or? I can't. Remember. We do. Sorry, I don't mean to answer the question, but it's, <laughs> yeah, we talked um, about it already. Yeah. yeah. Um, no variance though. We, the only variance we may ask for, and we're still debating it, is the front setback variance right here. Um, this happens to be the single steepest lot in the business and industry district. There is no steeper lot out there. And we're going through the initial test pits showed ledge and then this morning the soil scientist called me back and said, well, we tested the ledge and it's not ledge, it's something else. But we're going back and forth, especially given that we're on a cul-de-sac. So the traffic travels through here. The setback has already been pushed back further. 
we may ask for some level to reduce the cut into the hillside. Because it's going to be a fairly significant cut, and the further back we push, the more environmental impact there is overall. Is the sewer right out there on um, Annalee Place? The sewer's right here. Yeah, there's no sewer in Annalee Place. There is no sewer. You see the big the condo buildings out there, that 75 foot parallel piece to, to 104, right? No. Um, there's a large condo building. You guys see right next to the letters S24, you'll see a bunch of attached buildings there. Uh, that is where the sewer line is. It's the only privately owned sewer line in the town. Of oh, Maryland. that's privately owned. Is it, yep. Where's the public sewer line? It ends up at the Walkman Street, doesn't it? Goes down Reservoir This is a little bear. The sewer comes out here like this, and then the sewer line goes like this. So this is all connected to the sewer. A little bit. Plus something comes down the other side. Matter of fact, crossroads, which is right here, and it goes up to the sewer. So, A couple of quick editorial comments while I'm thinking about it. We only anticipate one possible actual wetlands crossing um, because this may be so. That huge development up above has a big drainage pond right there for all of its water. Water comes down, channels here, runs along the side of the road. We'll need a crossing, crossing over that in two places. Um, from what I understood from the soil scientists, that's not an actual wetlands crossing, that's a waters of the state or something. But um, we may, to get to a piece of upland up here, require one fairly small, probably three or four foot wetlands crossing. Although even then, that particular wetlands is just coming from a storm drain off of the above property. Um, and then the only other thing, uh, because I know some members of the staff are aware of this, we ran into is when we started walking around on this land and taking a look at it, um, there was water everywhere. It was it was insane. And what had happened is going back to about 2009 or 2010, that drainage facility up above had been in failure. And instead of going into the holding pond, almost all of the runoff for 128,000 square feet of impervious surface had been dumping straight across this lot. So we had to bring in some heavyweight soil people and kind of go through all of that. Um, but I think, worst case, we'd look at a weapons crossing somewhere right around there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they've already done their alteration. Of, he was super responsive. I give him kudos. I think within four days. He just, where the drainage channel runs is all but in the woods. And the state monitored the pond and the well, uh, the pond and the dam, but they didn't monitor the channel. And so, from up here, you didn't see anything going on. This pond is working great. It's always going. <laughs> That's exactly it. They were joking about how, you know, five, ten years ago, we had a rowboat floating in there, and now it's just bone dry. That's because it's all running across the land. Um, so, um, but it, despite it being wetlands, it is, I'm told, low value wetlands. It's high surface water. In fact, it wasn't even, cons the soil type was not considered jurisdictional wetlands a decade or so ago. They changed the definition for Ridgeberry. Ridgeberry soil types. Ridgeberry soil types um, to make that be, um, so we've had some brief conversations with the Conservation Commission and other than that one crossing, I don't see us impacting the wetlands at all. Uh, there'll be some special exceptions for buffers, but now, out of curiosity, I saw a few grimaces when I said possible variants from the front set back there. Um, this board is that's not. So far yeah, down that's, that's, that's okay. Just curious. Uh, okay. That's so far down the road. You, you one may not do it. You may be doing it a lot more than you're thinking you're going to do it now. Okay. There's no way to... Okay. Just curious if they're done. Um, question I kind of have is. Regarding the walking water overlay, if we're going to be moving stuff around, I know we're going from three lots down to two, which I guess argue is a benefit, but we're cutting that one module, but does that have any impact with the... There's a two-acre minimum walking water 
watershed overlay, you, you can't have lots less than two. So if, let's see if that lot was three acres, if you cut it back, you couldn't make it less than two. And I'm not sure what it is right now. That one's 2.2, I believe. 2.2. So you can take one two out of there. Okay. Yeah, so there's not much there. Or you can consolidate them all, and you could have more than one business building on one lot. They're not like dwellings. No, we've actually, I mean, part of the reason I want my wife's business there and my business there is child care issues, quite frankly. It just makes life a little bit easier when we're both working side by side. But at the same time, I want to keep my wife on her own little island over there. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it doesn't mean we... Everyone has their own space. Yes, yeah. yeah, she does. <laughs> There's, you know, wetlands here is kind of our moat factor, but uh, keeps her away from me and me away from her. Um, you want to access that upland wet for the child care center. Yeah, exactly. That's the crazy thing. So I have 13 ambulances, 24-7. All of us hit the quarter to dispatch out of Meredith. I think the maximum number of people we had on site today was six, and most of the time we have four people on site. Um, so if you triple that number, then you're going to end up having more than three people. Exactly. Uh, it wouldn't be 24-7 because the tripling would largely come from wheelchair services and community pay. Exactly. Yeah. So you service um, the region or is that simple? Uh, we also have bases in Moulinboro and Wolfboro. Is that what you mean? No, but does, um, does, would this building service Lakes region? Oh, the hospital? Yes. Yep, that was part of our issue when we were moving around places, is we, believe it or not, the hospital dials 911 a lot. Um, heart attack strokes, things that they can't treat. And we're the provider of 911 services for the hospital, so we have to maintain them under 20 minute response time for them as well. Yeah, sure. It's community paramedicine. It's working in two other states in the country right now. They're finishing protocols. My executive director, I think, is the vice chairperson of the protocol committee that's going through. And the idea basically is, in rural areas especially, you know, the town of Meredith pays me to provide one 24-7 ambulance here in Meredith, and then the other towns pay for another one in Moldenboro. On average, that ambulance treats two patients every 24 hours. So as you can imagine, I have a lot of very well-trained staff who are just there for the day, watching movies, cleaning things, killing time. And the idea started with a lot of police departments have something called the Good Morning Program. And that is, you know, let's say you're 91 years old and you're living at home alone, you sign up. And every morning the police department dispatch calls you and says, you know, hey, Mr. Tui, how are you feeling today? You good? Okay. And if you don't answer the phone after the third call, they send a cruiser out to your house to check on you. That's good morning. A, yeah, exactly. Good morning. Um, this is an elaboration on that. Now what we're doing is during our downtime, either individuals, individual family members, uh, doc, your, your discharging physician, can sign up high-risk patients. And the nice thing is, uh, it's no charge to the patient. To, it gets picked up, um, generally speaking, believe it or not, by the hospital. Um, but if you're a high-risk patient, let's say you just got discharged um, with congestive heart failure or COPD or whatever, it's your high-risk patient. We will go out to your house every day, every other day. It's kind of an in addition to the VNA type of thing. And we're not doing everything the VNA is doing, but we're going out, we're talking to you, we're checking your blood pressure, your temperature, you know, a couple of quick mental acuity tests, your blood sugar levels, all of these things. So instead of waiting until you're in a critical condition and need to be admitted to the emergency room, you know, let's say we go out today and we notice your blood pressure is a little high, Mr. Tui, and then again tomorrow we go out, and it's still elevated. We'll call your PCP at that point and say, you know, we've been in, 
Do you want to see them? And, yep, bring them in. And now you're going in for a doctor's room visit before your situations become acute, as opposed to waiting until you've gone into the emergency room. Justin, I think that um, when you come in to describe what facility you want to do today, yeah. phase two and phase three, I think it would be very beneficial for the board to understand all of the functions that go with phase one, and then this is how we see our expanding and, and why we would need phase two. And, you know, to understand all these things that you're talking about and how they go along with your phasing okay. um, and with, with your plan, I think would be very helpful. Okay. In other words, yeah. is, is this the, the, the construction phasing or are the services phasing? Both. Both. And they go together, so I think it would be helpful to understand. Th this building will fulfill what you know that we do right now our 911 business and our IFT business. Um, but if we step in, and we will be stepping in, this is, this is a known quantity at some point, and doing the community paramedicine, the only question is how many communities will we provide it for? Uh, because quite frankly, the BNA loves it, the hospitals love it. The only place that's really shown a, a opposition to it is firefighters unions. And so a lot of the question is in some of the union communities, will we end up, even though we don't provide their 911 service, will we be providing their community paramedicine service? So that would expand us into a whole lot of adjacent communities where we don't currently do 911. Um, so when you said the community or the, the services phasing or the building phasing, that would be one of those situations. I think the protocols are set to be approved in 2015. Um, the logic that only makes sense for the federal government, they're going to approve us to do it in 2015, they're going to approve how we pay, get paid for it in 2016. So let's assume that in 2016 we actually start doing this, you know, that alone could be an extra eight vehicles for us um, at that point. And then the, the second component of it is the wheelchair service. I mean, that's a light switch if this chip the state is getting increasingly desperate on transporting uh, wheelchair patients in rural New Hampshire. Um, and we talk to Governor Hassan on a regular basis and Commissioner Tempest. And if that changes, that's the type of thing where we could add 12 to 15 vehicles in 90 days. And if so, you the other state, I'd be interested. <laughs> yeah, that, that, therein lies the rub. Um, but, you know, so that could be a big change. And, I don't know whether I'll actually, whether I build some of these buildings and maybe rent a month to month to contractor friends or in all likelihood probably just wouldn't do anything but because these steel buildings go up so quickly um, that if we know we need something you can put it in, especially if we've got all the infrastructure on the lot, the sewer and the water and everything else and we could plug it in. Good evening, you'll make your application. Next month. <laughs> See you soon. Yeah. Just as a comment, um, I, you're probably aware that Krikon Building just went up over in Wonder. Yes. Their parking service is all drainage. It's, it's not paid. Parking is not paid. Yes. Um, yes. You were talking about that sort of thing, and that's particularly good for clarity. Water, you know what it is? It keeps the water, water filters with the oil and the rubber and all that. I appreciate it. We actually hit the winter snow removal issues with sand. Yeah. We don't sand it. I know you don't sand it. That's why you have winter snow removal We had actually debated that with this apron right here just because this drainage runs yeah. all the way down. Oh, it's part of the parking lot. Oh, it is part of the parking lot.